Welcome to What's Next Longevity Deal Talk, the podcast to turn to for an inside look at the age tech economy. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Mary Furlong. Great to be launching this with you, Mary. Yes, it's so exciting. There's so much innovation and so many companies and investors coming into the space. And we are delighted to have this opportunity to bring them together and for dealmakers to share their stories. For instance, the Helper Bees has raised $12.8 million in a round led by Trust Ventures. And here with us is the Helper Bees CEO and co-founder, Char Hugh. Hi, Char. Hey. And from Trust Ventures, Vice President Richard Dolefate. So to start, it would be helpful, Char, for you to give us some background on Helper Bees and the mission and what it does. Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here on your inaugural podcast uh, and definitely excited for the concept that we're talking about today with, with Trust Ventures leading our round. Um, Helper Bees, we're an insure tech company, uh, obviously playing in the age tech arena. Uh, we feel as though we have built what I'll call America's aging in place platform, uh, which we promised we wouldn't be provocative, but is a big statement. Um, what we do is build software and tools to allow several uh, tech enabled services to live off of one platform. And these services are quite important in order to power aging in place. So these are non-medical services. Mary, you know this, you devoted your entire career to this. It's not a physician coming in, a nurse practitioner coming in. It's your pest control service. It's your grab bar installer, your no slip mat or your home caregiver. We have built the infrastructure, the platform to allow all these services to exist. Uh, we credential them, meaning we just create quality providers. And we allow very large payers or large organizations to tap into all of these transformative services for either their members, their policyholders, or their employees through one conduit. So it's an easy access to a whole ecosystem of vetted aging in place vendors, which is why we really think it is the way to power aging in place in America. And of course, I'm 73. And what happens as you get older, you need help with a lot of those services. And so to have them at your fingertips is really a great idea. Um, let's talk about Trust Ventures and how did you come to lead this investment, Richard? Tell us a little bit about your firm and what got you involved. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, personally, I'm a lawyer by training. So I've been working with early stage companies for the last Oh, five, six years. So I basically started off in the gig economy space, looking at, you know, these early stage companies that needed to figure out like the future of employment in America when people had two, three jobs and, you know, um, Grubhub and Dash, you know, Dash Pass or whatever it is. And, you know, ultimately what we discovered is there weren't a lot of great policy and regulatory folks that wanted to take these types of engagements on because they were a little risky, right? They involved, you know, working with startups on Kind of weird, ambiguous issues within the, the regulatory framework. And candidly, most lawyers are, you know, charging a thousand dollars an hour for memos that, you know, have meaning, you know, minimal value, I would say, uh, back to, to the end customer. And so ultimately we realized there was a huge opportunity to do more work with these early stage companies and then really drive some meaningful value on the early stage side uh, for folks that knew they were going to have some form of regulatory and policy needs down the road. Um, so that's what trust is really about. We're ultimately an early stage fund, but we invest in these areas where regulatory and compliance work is gonna be necessary for the success of those industries. Unsurprisingly, you know, aging technology is huge on that. So much of what we do is within the healthcare space or the care space where there are so many, you know, very thoughtful rules and regulations built to protect our senior population. But the question is, how do those rules and regulations ultimately kind of meet innovation and the future of what these you know, services are really going to look like? Um, so from that end, you know, we've been looking at elder care for, for, for years, honestly, and, and kind of thinking about what are the right kinds of companies for us to walk into that really give us an opportunity to tell the tremendous story of seniors getting access to better and you know, more useful services, leaning into the transformative societal movement of people wanting to age in place further, um, while also giving us a chance to kind of help from the policy standpoint. Um, and the helper bees was kind of the perfect mix of all those things. You know, there's this great platform that tells a fantastic narrative of being able to really transform the way that, you know, senior Americans and, and even internationally, hopefully one day, uh, folks can lean on these types of services. And then ultimately, um, we can do a lot of work on the policy end because so much of this is going to happen through channels like Medicare Advantage, 
or you know the future of long-term care um, and that takes a special kind of knowledge base to really see it to success and you know that's what our fund does is, is kind of wade into these regulatory morasses if you will so from that standpoint it fit our thesis really well and then of course it was kind of this you know, great area of, you know, alliance building, you know, obviously there are so many folks working on senior policy today, you know, how can we get them excited about the future of what, you know, aging in place could look like. And so really the helper bees is just, you know, a testament to that ability to potentially change our narrative of what senior care could be. You know, we produce the Washington Innovation Summit, which covers the policy every December, and then the Venture Summit in June. But you found each other in Austin. So how did you meet and how quickly did the deal come together? I'm always curious about who met yeah. who and how did you find each other? And yeah, I love I, the brand name. I love the name Helper because that's what we all need. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take this first just because, you know, I very shamefully probably should have reached out to Shar years ago, um, to be honest. And he had been already doing this transformative work within the city and he had ended up raising his Series A uh, from Silverton uh, a while back. And so we, I had kind of always had him on the radar, but I figured, you know, what really needed to be true in order for us to really get interested was this sense of being able to kind of take that regulatory and policy initiative to the next level. So what really sold us on the helper bees this time and what got us really excited is, you know, as Char said, it's like, how do you build this marketplace for all these services together? And how do you distribute that in an interesting way? Um, one thing that's happened over the last couple of years is, the Medicare system has really pushed auxiliary benefits for seniors as a meaningful way to dole out benefits. Um, and, you know, we're just getting started with this. You know, I think one of the amazing things about the helper bees is they actually have the analytics to tell you um, how these services impact health, out, out, health outcomes, which is so unique. And, you know, I think for the most part, many of the legacy players in this space have never really been able to kind of put all those pieces together. Um, but we're now at the precipice of that. And that obviously really piqued our interest, right? And so when we got that story, um, honestly, it, it came together quite quickly. I think I probably, uh, you know, bothered Char quite a lot <laughs> over, our, over our diligence process, just getting more and more time with them. And we just kept feeding each other information, getting more and more excited about it. So had you sent out an email or pick up the phone or how did it, how did it start? It was, a, it was an introduction from, I think, another fund, um, which is strange. Austin's a pretty small community and had never come across trust, but... Uh, it, was, it was a great intro, and and um, I didn't think we had a regulatory uh, framework at all to, to work out. And Richard, to his credit, was like, "No, you should take the call," and and we did. And I'm like, "Oh, we have a ton to think about." And deal really did come together pretty quickly. Um, they were great partners, so you know, shameless plug for them for any uh, entrepreneurs out there. Um, we had a lot of interest. Trust was. Uh, was really from their strategic perspective on regulatory and compliance work and their expertise there made it was a no brainer. So beyond the money, you, you looked at uh, what they're bringing to the table, the, the, the information, the benefits, the expertise they have. That's, that was a big selling yeah. point. It sounds like. Yeah. Trust is, is structured almost like a PE firm with their, with their supplemental services that they provide supplemental services, their supplemental uh, team. So we have marketing support, re regulatory and compliance work. We meet with them every other week with a whole team that is invested uh, quite literally in what we're doing. And it's an extension of our team. So we get, uh, we, we expanded our team with bringing them on board. And that's just tip not typical uh, of most venture funds, especially early stage funds. This is definitely growth stage in the private equity where they have recruitment teams and marketing teams and that sort of thing. And about the funding, what is that going to enable the helper bees to do? Uh, well, continue to grow. So we've had some pretty significant growth since our Series A round back in 2020. Um, we've as Richard mentioned, trust focus on regulatory and compliance issues is going to become more and more critical as, as Medicare Advantage and other payers enter the space. We believe that's our competitive advantage as well, as we've built out a robust credentialing platform uh, for Medicare Advantage. And we want to create, uh, continue to create uh, that as a defensive perimeter around the services that go into the home for quality reasons, but of course, to give payers peace of mind that this is something you should invest in. Yes, we have a lot of folks who are worried about delivering service into the home, but there's a great way to do it. And by not doing it, we're not transforming lives. And so uh, leaning on our compliance framework as a competitive advantage, uh, the funding will help us do that. We have a number of different regulatory approaches that we're chasing down right now. We'll continue to feel this growth, but in a very methodical and 
dare say it, grown up way. And so instead of just an early stage startup who's just trying to storm the gates, uh, we, we, uh, we are in a heavily regulated environment and have the infrastructure to support all of that work. Richard, let me ask you, you are the head of the deal team at Trust Ventures. You had not been in the age tech space so much before you'd been looking at it, it sounds like. Why was the time right now to jump in? Yeah, that's it's a really good question. So part of it is again, it's this, this regulatory story of you know where we can really find value. Part of it is also honestly just finding the right kind of product. So I think the challenge with anything in age tech is that it is complex. Uh, that's also its strength um, as well as its weakness, right? You have to do more work to learn about it. But once you do learn and you do find these great teams that have that built-in competency to really sell these products in a meaningful way with all these different stakeholders. It's, it's, it's quite a complex process, but if you can do it, um, you're, you're building actually a pretty sticky competitive product in a huge market that's been relatively underserviced, I think, from a, from a technological perspective. And so, you know, part of it was just finding the right fit. One of the things we loved about Char and his team is that they have such immense experience in the space. You know, you could ask Char all these questions about you know, aging services, and he's going to know everything about it, which is exactly where you need to be with a product like this. You can't really just cobble it together uh, last minute. That's not going to work as well in an, in an area where you need to get these types of difficult approvals. The quality of care matters so much, and your relationship with each of these stakeholders is so crucial, um, and you have to really treat it the right way from day one. Um, so part of that was just finding those right fits. And then the other thing is, is um, just learning. You know, so I think lots of work has been done when you look at for instance, like anti-aging startups and, and things like that, where I think you can tell this kind of really amazing story of, you know, creating new markets where they didn't exist and the, you know, revolution of preventative care. Um, I think other areas of aging technology have maybe kind of like fallen behind a little bit just because we have this universe where like they, they don't look as sexy um, effectively, but that's not a really good reason not to do it. It just means you really have to dive in, um, you know, the helper bees is working on core problems that people face today with all these aging in place services. And, you know, ultimately that's a wonderful story that we can lean on to tell the reason of why this type of work is so important and needs to continue and, and move forward. Um, so we actually found that to be kind of a strength. And so I think for us, that was a huge reason why this was kind of the right bet at the right time. Um, I also, hopefully there will be more policy headwinds for, uh, you know, aging, services and, and benefits over time. Um, I suspect some of that will come around in the next couple of years. And then, you know, over the next decade, I think it's almost inevitable. I think that's right. Um, Steve Jurvetson once said, you know, it's demographics, which you have, it's technology, which you have, and it's the regulatory environment. And the regulatory environment is going in this direction. But how fortunate that you found each other and found that expertise, because it is a lot about the business model. So any advice you'd give to other investors about looking into the market or share to any entrepreneurs? Uh, I guess I'll go first just because I'm off mute. I, I think entrepreneurs in this space, as Richard mentioned, like I, I've been, I've had 12 year long career, long-term care from building dementia communities to home health agencies and not what we're doing here. Um, I think follow your business model. I think Mary, you were, you were talking about this where What's your payer source? So huge demographics, but private pay, is, it can be challenging with some solutions. And Mary, you know, over the last few years, a lot of companies, uh, startup graveyards are littered with companies who had B2C models who just couldn't monetize it with enough scale. Um, so I think really thinking about your go-to-market and your channel-based strategy is critical. You do have a huge TAM, so the total address market is massive, um, but who's actually buying these services? And if it's incredibly cutting edge, sometimes you might be... Um, too forward. And I think that's where our approach towards looking at payers who are, Mary, you had mentioned this uh, on the regulatory uh, uh, tailwinds are really pushing towards that. And I think that's why compliance is so critical. Um, and so I would say early stage companies, think about the quality and the compliance work that you're doing. Uh, that will give you a competitive advantage. It takes a little bit more time and to be thoughtful and, and money when it's money is really hard to come by uh, at the early stages. But I think it'll pay dividends when you talk to large payer sources. Yeah, I know some entrepreneurs walking around with spreadsheets with Medicare Advantage listed the number of Medicare Advantage programs they want to talk to, but how great to have that expertise around the table in your investor partner. That's right. Richard, did you want to jump in on Mary's question? 
Yeah, I think from the investor perspective, you know, fortunately, I do think this is changing a little bit. I mean, you know, there there have been some very attractive fundraises for aging in place uh, technologies or, you know, just senior technology um, services over the last couple of months even. So I do suspect we're kind of hitting potentially that inflection point where there is more growth capital interest in the space. Uh, time will tell, of course. Um, you know, I think a lot of the low hanging fruit of, you know, healthcare services and, you know, some of the um, let's say kind of like the baby boomer services have already been pretty well addressed. And so as the more complex services for kind of more needy populations becomes more interesting to the investor base as they kind of lose those, those easier uh, startups to kind of build and those companies to support, I, I think this is kind of the next, this is the next frontier for that, to be honest. So I would say, you know, from an investor standpoint, don't be afraid, you know, ultimately like so much of being an investor is, really focusing on what is not on the trend line and what could potentially be interesting. Um, and, you know, I think Mary, as you mentioned, like from, from our standpoint, there is a tremendous societal shift happening here. And so you can make the same types of, not only do you have like this massive addressable market today, but you can actually make this transformative story about how that market is going to need a new, a better, a different solution than what has historically been there um, in a way that I actually think is, is pretty unique and, and very compelling. So I think those investors that actually take the time to get to know it and to bring on advisors that can help them review these kinds of deals and do it effectively um, are putting them in a position, are putting themselves in a good position to continue to succeed because, you know, I, I think the helper bees hopefully won't be our last elder care deal. I suspect there will be others in, in, in the pipeline at some point. And, you know, I think it's inevitable that to see companies like the helper bees succeed, you're going to need more innovation. You know, like there, there are so many other pieces of this puzzle that are still left to figure out. Our next guest joins us from Israel. Karen Etkin is the author of a new book titled The Age Tech Revolution, and she has a website at thegerontechnologist.com. Karen, I have the book right with me. We're so happy to have you join us. I was uh, thrilled to be interviewed for the book. So congratulations. And I think we see from your background, you're number one on the Amazon bestseller list. How did you do that already? Uh, yes, well, I was very fortunate to have the book uh, receive a lot of uh, purchases on the very few first few days. Uh, so we got to the bestseller status on the demographic and on the gerontology category. So that was great. Thank you for inviting me, by the way. Well, Karen, let's share with the audience a bit about you and what led you to what you are doing. So I'm actually a gerontologist by training, and I spent the last few years working in tech, uh, both as an employee and as a co-founder of age tech startups. And I realized during my time way back in 2016 or 17, uh, when I was working at Intuition Robotics, that we were actually part of this big and very interesting ecosystem, right? There are hundreds of startups all over the world developing tech solutions for the challenges of aging. Um, so that's sort of what brought me to start the Geron Technologist, a sort of um, a media and education platform about the age tech ecosystem. And it's also what brought me to, to write the age tech revolution because I feel like this ecosystem is so wonderful um, and it deserves recognition. So I do, what I can to, to help spread the word and to shout from the virtual rooftops what fantastic work everyone is doing. And also that every entrepreneur and every investor who's sort of, sort of looking for their next adventure should definitely be looking at this space. Is there something in your background that led you to this interest? Well, you could say that... Um, it's sort of a natural interest that my generation has in technology. I'm a millennial, so I'm a digital uh, native, if you will. And also when I started my career and I used to work in, in the nonprofit sector, we were doing some very impactful work, but it was very hard to scale because it's all dependent on, on, on people, right? And technology is scalable. And 
way back then, I realized that we had to use technology to, to tackle some of the challenges of aging because we, we simply did not have enough people to, to fix all of those issues. So we had to use technology to, to create solutions that scale. So Karen, I've known you a long time since the beginning of Intuition Robotics. Um, one of the quotes from the book where when we, you and I talked, I said it started out as a quiet march. Now it's a global chorus of talent. So what did you learn at Intuition Robotics? And what do you think is responsible for the growth of HTAC as a space and a sector? So one of the things that I learned uh, and really impacted me was that it really it really does take a choir, right? If they say it takes a village to raise a child, and it really does take a lot of people who are not only passionate about what they do, but people from multiple disciplines to create some of these solutions. So at Intuition Robotics, I was the first employee and I was a gerontologist. We had obviously uh, user experience experts and user interface designers, but we also had gesture designers, sound uh, engineers, hardware engineers, software engineers, um, people who come from a background of, of uh, screenwriting and, and theater to sort of create a personality uh, for, for LEQ, for the robot. Um, so it, it really, um, intuition robotics may be sort of an, an outlier because we did have so many people from multiple disciplines. But when I look at some of the other startups in this category, we see that many of the other startups have people from all types of occupations, right? If we look at, um, at Solo, for example, Roy, the founder, comes from a background of, of music creation. He used to be a, a music producer, a musician. And we've got um, Megillah, who, I'm, uh, who I think you're familiar with, so Nathan, the founder, has a background uh, as a filmmaker. So that's something that's incredibly interesting about this ecosystem and definitely something that I, I enjoy. And in the new book, you talk about the COVID pandemic still with us and <laughs> the impact it's had on the need for more and better technology tools, including for older adults. Yes. So one thing that COVID definitely did is, first of all, it, it really pushed forward adoption of technology for everyone, including older adults. And it also sort of brought to awareness the fact that having um, all, older adults use technology and, and providing them with access to technology and, and digital literacy skills is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Um, the same thing goes for senior living, for example. Suddenly everyone uh, realizes that internet is infrastructure and not an amenity. So that's something that COVID did. And I can say from my personal perspective as someone who, who sat down to write a book during the pandemic, I got to interview older adults from all over the world. And getting them to do an interview over Zoom was, was, was a no-brainer. I just sent them the Zoom link and we met on Zoom. And I don't think that would have been as easy in 2019. Um, it is a global ecosystem. So we see this market, part of the reason people are discovering it because the boomers are now 76 in 2022 and over the next 10 years, there's a lot of market opportunity. So it's not just investors and entrepreneurs, we're seeing corporations come into the market. Can you talk about some of the corporations that you interviewed? Uh, absolutely. So uh, I don't believe I did any any um, direct interviews with any large corporations, but I've definitely been following the work of all the big tech companies in this space. So Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, Apple have all been taking major strides in uh, creating offerings for older, adult, older adults and family caregivers. So Amazon, for example, they've created, uh, they started with the Alexa Care Hub and now they've got the Alexa together and they've partnered with uh, companies like Viar that offer fall detection sensors for the home. So they really sort of um, created an, another set of features for their uh, line of Alexa devices 
to cater for the older demographic and for family caregiver. And Apple has been uh, steadily releasing features over the past few years. They start, it started with fall detection for the Apple Watch. Now there's a gate assessment for any iOS device. Um, so I think the fact that big tech companies are um, taking an interest in this space and Frankly, if we are completely honest, they are the ones who actually have the resources to market their offerings direct to consumers. I think it's a it's a great step in the right direction, and the fact that they are partnering with existing age tech startups is great for the ecosystem. I want to say a word about Best Buy Health. So we've been following Best Buy since they acquired Great Call and working closely with them. And of course, they saw the need for continuing learning and education, because to skill up in the workforce, especially during COVID, you needed to have tech skills, right? And they were early on with the gig squad, but now there's a convergence of healthcare, home care, and tech companies, all interested in older adults to improve their fitness, improve their uh, learning skills, and uh, keep them safe at home. Yeah, I think all, all of this is wonderful, wonderful progress. So we're sort of gradually seeing sort of the maturation of not only the age tech ecosystem, but also uh, outsiders sort of, right? Corporations who serve the general population. Suddenly they realize that older adults have other needs, not just health. I mean, health is great. Yes, we definitely need to keep everyone healthy, but there are also challenges around aging in place. There are also challenges around digital literacy and around um, continuing education and sort of the uh, unretirement, right? Because people want to continue working well into their 70s, 80s, some, some people well even into their 90s. So I think it's a, definitely a, a silver lining for sure. You know, you mentioned before people that you interviewed getting on Zoom. Do you think the perception of seniors not being terribly competent with technology, is that starting to evaporate? I wish I could say that. I think we are sort of in, in we're all part of this ecosystem. And I think everyone who works with older adults understands that older adults these days are much more tech savvy than previous generations. However, the general population, in the general population, there is still this misconception that older adults don't use technology, don't want to use technology. Um, and we also have to take into consideration the negative portrayal of older adults in the media. And until we, we fix all of that, we still have these sort of ageist perceptions that are very, very common. And I think it's, I don't know, I think I, it's part of our sort of job to, um, to, to sort of spread the word and fix it. Um, Ashton Applewhite has been doing amazing, word, amazing work um, in, in fighting ageism. Uh, and, and so many people in this ecosystem are also doing tremendous work in in showing uh, positive and and real portrayals of older adults in their in their marketing and in their advertising, um, but for the general population, there's still a long way to go. You know, I remember um, when I had senior net, I asked an older adult, uh, of which now I am one. You know, uh, could you? Uh, help with the Macintosh. And he said he used to be chief scientist at a major company. So we do have a very well-educated older adult population who are learners and their use of technology is, I mean, it skyrocketed last year, according to Lori Orlov's report. Um, so, and it's across different sectors from man money management to home safety to, um, many other things. So it's kind of an exciting time to see older adults as a resource. It's absolutely an exciting time. I keep telling everyone that we've never had, first of all, we've never had so many people reach old age. We've never had uh, so many uh, people reach old age and being healthy and active and being and being genuinely interested in in, in uh, continuing to learn and learning new technology, even though 
some of the products, some of the general population uh, consumer devices aren't necessarily designed with older adults in mind. People are still willing to, to make the effort uh, to learn. And I think we're in a wonderfully exciting time. Karen, one thing I loved about your book was the, the appendix and the resources there. So I think that everyone in the space should pick up a copy. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Mary, for inviting me. Thank you, Fred. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, congratulations again on the book, The Age Tech Revolution. For those of you who are listening, we've been holding it up in the whole time. Uh, a bestseller in the gerontology section on Amazon. And on the work that you're doing, uh, Karen, the website is thegerontechnologist.com. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. Mary, there is so much news ahead as we're recording this. Another headline arrived, a place for mom, the giant online referral platform for senior housing, announced it has raised $175 million in growth equity funding. The funding is led by Insight Partners. Yes, I've been following A Place for Mom for a long time, and um, one of the managing directors at Insight Partners is joining the board, according to Senior Housing News, which is one of the most trusted sources in the market. How exciting to have our first Longevity Deal Talk podcast. So as these deals happen, we can cover them as they come out of the day. It's exactly what Karen was saying. There's this growing ecosystem, and so exciting to see the investors picking up her book and wanting to understand the market. And then of course we lean into our Venture Summit, which is every June where we have a lot of deals there too. So there is so much more to come. Stay tuned and thank you for being with us for What's Next Longevity Deal Talk.